Hi everyone, welcome back to English 221. This is for class for Wednesday, the 22nd, where I wanted to talk about A Midsummer Night's Dream now that we have finished watching the performance. And I also wanted to talk about the academic calendar. As you know, this past Monday was a holiday and that means that GCC made this Friday a class to make up for the Monday class that we didn't meet. Um, where we didn't have any meetings. And in terms of where we are in the syllabus, uh, we're doing fairly well. We're just ever so slightly behind. So I don't think we need that Friday meeting. That said, if it turns out that any of you wanted to touch base with me on Friday, or at any time, honestly, about any of the elements of the class, please feel free to do so. But luckily, Mother Nature has been rather kind, so we haven't had any significant course cancellations, so we are not going to be having that optional Friday class, which is listed on our course outline as a continuation of the Midsummer Night's Dream discussion, which I can carry over into next week. So if you will see the notes below, I've given some extensions in terms of upcoming assignments. The second journal, which is on Midsummer Night's Dream, according to the syllabus, would be due on the 27th, which is a Monday. Uh, but I would take it up until that Wednesday and 11.59 p.m. via PDF to my email, Ruiz, R-U-I-Z at gcc.mass.edu. It'll be very similar to what you did with your first journal, which you should have received from me at this point. So if not, please let me know. So I'm thinking about a page or so in response to Midsummer Night's Dream. And obviously there's much more than you can do than just a page. So this is just the beginnings. And eventually we'll be talking about our first paper, which won't be due until the ending of March. So we've got some time. And the first paper will be devoted to the comedies being either Midsummer Night's Dream or our next comedy, which happens to be Much Ado About Nothing. Though you'd also have the option of writing on the sonnets. Though, as you see, the sonnets are very different than the actual dramas themselves. So I thought of the sonnets as a kind of introduction to Shakespearean language. But that said, I wanted to just give us a little bit more time with the journal so that we could put some closure onto Midsummer Night's Dream. And at this point, what you should be doing is reading our next play. That happens to be Much Ado About Nothing. It happens to be a comedy. And once again, we will see performance as well as talk about the play. And you know that watching performance is in no way a substitute for reading the play. It's merely a supplement. And with Midsummer Night's Dream, you saw a version in the Globe Theater. So you saw, in effect, the best of the best. And I wish we could have seen it live, but unfortunately that's not a possibility. At least we were able to see the film production. And, and obviously a film's production is going to be different than actually seeing a live production. But I think you get a, a sense of the flavor and the atmosphere of being in the Globe Theater. And they did take some liberties. Um, obviously the um, tap dancing is something that is quite unusual. And it's the only time I've ever seen it done in a Midsummer Night's Dream performance. Uh, I've seen Midsummer Night's Dream done in many ways. Um, so it could be very uh, traditional. It can be very contemporary. I've even seen Midsummer Night's Dream done in the new to kind of reinforce the idea of reverting back to the natural world. Um, much in the same way, I've seen Puck played in many different ways, whether it be by a child or an adult or an older individual, a middle-aged person. I've seen both genders play Puck. Puck kind of reminds me of a Peter Pan character in that there is a lot of latitude there. But I hope that watching that performance assisted you to get a sense of not just the atmosphere of a play, but some of the plot. As I was indicating, A Midsummer Night's Dream is notoriously complex. And the reason why is because it's about love. And one of the themes is that love is notoriously complex. 
The good news is that when we read another comedy, Much Ado About Nothing, we won't have as many characters, so it'll probably be easier to hold on to the plot. And that said, Much Ado About Nothing is very firmly set in the world of reality, so we won't have things like fairies and fantasies. And I did that very purposefully to give us a play about love that's set in the fantasy world and then a play about love that's set in the, quote, real world, unquote, so that if we wanted to, we could compare and contrast. Some considerations, as you can see in the notes below. Always think about the significance of the title. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, the title is particularly important because of Midsummer, And this idea of Midsummer or the uh, spring equinox, and this is the longest day of the year. And what this means is that it is a pagan holiday in which um, the way that individuals would celebrate is through fertility rites. This idea that the spring is leading to rebirth and renewal, which is what we will see in the summertime. So it's very curious that there is such a focus on virginity for female during this time period. And yet Shakespeare sets this play in a very uh, sexually charged um, environment. And that's very deliberate. The fact that it's also in the wilderness because the wilderness is wild or untamed. Uh, the reverting to the natural world as opposed to the civilized world, the world of society and order, which is represented by Athens. And although Shakespeare sets the play in an exotic locale, at least based from a London perspective, the play may as well be in London because of outside of saying that it's in Athens, it seems very much like Britain. That would have been very Shakespearean at the time to set his plays in, in other locales such as Italy, but then again to have it seem like it's very British because this was part of the age of exploration. So this was a way to make the play seem a little bit more exotic. And the idea of Midsummer. I think is particularly important in reference to another uh, pagan holiday that's referenced in the play, and that is May Day. And May Day is a day that also celebrates this idea of uh, fertility and union. And both days are highly sexually charged. And if you're familiar with anything about May Day, you might be familiar with the May Pole, which is something that oftentimes it has ribbons and flowers, individuals dance around. But the May Pole is a phallic symbol, again, representing fertility. And it becomes important in what I call the catfight scene in A Midsummer Night's Dream, where one of the insults hurled by Hermia to Helena is that she's a painted maypole. Painted would mean that she has cosmetics, and we already saw what Shakespeare thought about false beauty and cosmetics in some of his sonnet commentary. But the idea that Helena is also a maypole because she's tall and thin, um, as opposed to Hermia, who is of a shorter stature. But also, Hermia has just insulted her former best friend by calling her a phallus, in effect. So, the idea that it's set in the nighttime, which again is not only a time for eroticism, but it also is a time of mystery and a possible time of magic. And this idea of a dream and love itself can be compared to a kind of dream, something that's out of our control, something that can be quite pleasant, but also can turn into a nightmare. And you'll see that there are many commentaries about love and the different ways that we can think about love over the course of the play. We see the difficulties and the conflicts associated with love and no one is immune. So we are given a series of couples who represent different ages, different status of relationships, um, a, a different uh, socioeconomic levels, and yet they all have trials and tribulations in terms of love. Initially, we're introduced to King Theseus and Queen Hippolyta. So they would be on the upper end of the chain of being. This idea during Shakespeare's time that everything had a hierarchy or ranking in society with God being at the top 
and then the angels themselves in heaven would be ranked and then men and, or humanity would come next because they have a greater ability to reason but within humanity there would be rankings so men above women and adult above child and obviously it reinforces many of the stereotypes that we have today but this sense of everyone being immune or everyone not being immune to the idea of the conflicts with love is represented with the king and a queen and king theseus has conquered queen hippolyta in love um this would be a very typical kind of union that basically he conquered her in war so this was a political move and again while this would not be an uncommon coupling particularly for people of the upper classes the play is a comedy so even though there is a sense of unhappiness from Hippolyta at the beginning of the play that's resolved by the ending of the play the assumption is that love and affection develop after marriage not before marriage but this sense of conquering and love and who has power and who doesn't have power is a major theme and you might have noticed that the actors who play Theseus and Hippolyta they also play the fairy king and queen, Oberon and Titania. To, and I, I think it was a wonderful casting choice to illustrate the parallels between these two couples. What a great paper that would be comparing and contrasting these two couples. Um, that said, uh, the king of the fairy kingdom is just as much in conflict over love. He represents the married stage as opposed to Theseus and Hippolyta, who I suppose could be considered the engaged stage. But um, basically what we see is Oberon and Titania arguing over a changeling boy. This is a part of fairy f folklore. Shakespeare would have used a good number of pagan references in his play. As we know, there is very little that's, that's definitive about Shakespeare's biography. So people who are trying to uncover some sort of a conspiracy theory will oftentimes point to a play like this and suggest that Shakespeare wasn't Christian and that perhaps he was pagan instead because of the pagan references. Again, this is all conjecture. But what we do know is that this changeling boy that Oberon and Titania are arguing over is part of fairy folklore. There is such a thing as a changeling. So Shakespeare used that idea, but he adapted it. He changed it to suit his purposes. So in fairy folklore, a changeling is basically a child that's been stolen, a human child that's been stolen from the fairy land and the fairies have replaced instead um, one of their own fairies um, in place of the human baby. This was a wonderful way for humans to rationalize why their child might have some sort of uh, physical or intellectual challenge that this would not be their child. It was a changeling. It was, Their child was stolen in the middle of the night by fairies and what was left was this fairy substitute. But Shakespeare didn't necessarily go into that idea as much as he went into the idea of power and conflict and who has power and who doesn't. That the story that uh, uh, Queen Titania gives is that her serving woman died in childbirth, so she feels an obligation to raise this changeling boy. And Oberon says he wants the changeling, and she says no. This would be quite daring at the time period for a woman to defy her husband or her father, which is where we get to the next couples or the next set of couples. We've got Hermia and Lysander who are quite happy together. They're at the dating stage, if you will, and they're a younger couple, but her father does not approve. Again, it would be very rare indeed for a daughter to defy her father. A father would be seen as basically a kind of godlike figure that would have ultimate control, which would eventually be transferred over to the husband. And the fact that Hermia dares to defy her father, and by the ending of the play, Hermia ends up getting what she wanted. She ended up with Lysander. It's a, a, a rather progressive statement. 
I can't necessarily say the same about the fairy king and queen because ultimately the fairy queen is saying that not only will she not give up the changeling boy, but she's so angry with the arguments that they've had that nature itself is in discord because of it. And she has, quote, forsworn her marriage bed, unquote, which means that she's denying sexual relations to her husband, which is, again, another way that power can be exerted within a coupling. But as you know, by the ending of the play, it turns out that Oberon does indeed get that changeling boy. And he humiliates, basically, Titania along the way. So Shakespeare's uh, commentaries are often complex. And we know that Hermia's father, Aegeus, is not supportive. And he doesn't give a particularly good reason why, outside of the fact that he wants what he wants. Or if you've ever hold, heard an authority figure say something to you to the effect of, because I told you so, then you probably understand the dynamic that's going on here. And that Aegeus, Hermia's father, has decided that Demetrius is a better suitor than Lysander. But both Demetrius and Lysander pretty much are from the same class. And in fact, they seem to be rather comparable. Um, I had a professor in college who both said they were jerks. It's just a question of who was the bigger jerk. But their lines could easily be interchanged with one another, even though their names are different. Um, I think it's very deliberate that the actors playing these two characters are cast very similarly in the version that, or have very physical or similar physical appearances in the version that we saw of Midsummer to kind of reinforce that idea that they could be interchangeable. Another commentary about love is that one lover is just as interchangeable as another. And we know that Hermia and Helena have similar names, so it's easy to mix them up. Again, that's very deliberate on Shakespeare's part to show that one lover can be substituted with another very easily. They are different, though, in terms of physical appearance, which is going to be important in that Hermia is short and she's a brunette with dark hair and dark eyes which would not be considered the standard of beauty at the time as we saw with Shakespearean sonnets the standard of beauty was to be considered fair in other words blonde hair and Helena in fact represents the standard of beauty um, I'm very pleased that they cast an actor who's tall and thin to represent Helena. And I've sometimes seen performances where they haven't done that. And I think they really missed um, one of the points that Shakespeare was making in the drama. And the one who's considered beautiful by society has none of the men's attention. Neither Lysander nor Demetrius are interested in her. And what we learn is that prior to the play, Demetrius and Helena were a couple. So he has changed his mind. That illustrates how love can be fickle. And worse, he's chosen Helena's best friend as his new love. So we will also see how friendships can be destroyed when it comes to love relationships, or at least can be threatened to be destroyed in terms of love relationships as the play progresses. But this power dynamic of something like a King Theseus conquering a Queen Hippolyta, a father Aegeus telling his daughter to follow his will or else what she will face is a nunnery or death, um, a, a King Oberon telling a, a Queen Fairy Titania, give me this changeling child, and if not, there will be consequences. And we see how Oberon enlists Puck's assistance in order to make um, Fairy Titania fall in love with the first thing she sees Again, another commentary about love, that when we are in love, we become so obsessed with the person we love with that those things that used to matter to us no longer do. So as she is distracted, then Fairy Oberon is able to take that changeling child. Again, more as a power play than for any other reason. Though one suspects there's probably perhaps some jealousy involved as well because chances are she's devoting more attention to this changeling boy than she is to ferry over on her husband. So we see this dynamic throughout the play of power struggles in, in terms of love. And with Helena, who is basically considered beautiful, 
but yet has no male attention. We'll see how that dynamic changes over the course of the play, granted through love juice. And in fact, you could say that love is a kind of magic spell, that when we are in love, it's almost as if we are um, under control of forces beyond us. What happens with that love juice is that eventually both men end up loving Helena and no one loves Hermia, the short brunette. Of course, that's going to lead to some tensions between their friendship. We're even told that they were closer than sisters at one point, but we'll see how that can easily be destroyed. So we see how love can be exhilarating. We see how it can be humiliating. We see how it can be requited. We see how it can be unrequited. We see how it can be changeable and fickle. And this idea, too, of uh, think about some of the language we use co in contemporary times with love. We say we fall in love. This idea of falling, something that's out of our control, that's accidental, that can result in injury, even death. So even though this is a lighthearted play that ends, quote, happily, unquote, and that none of the characters die, and it seems that most of the love relationship conflicts have been resolved, that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a, a kind of darkness to this play, especially when we see Fairy Oberon and how he's trying to control and manipulate. We know that um, Hermia's father, Aegeus, is so frustrated that he ends up going to the law of the land. So that would be King Theseus, who has his own problems, of course, with the queen that he's conquered, Queen Hippolyta. And he asks King Theseus to intervene, and Theseus basically tells Hermia, listen to your father, and if you don't, you've got the option of a nunnery or death. Both would be seen as equally horrific. Uh, but he does give her time to contemplate, and that time is just enough time for us to have the play unfold. So there's a practical reason for this. Uh, if she had to make a decision on the spot, we wouldn't have a play. But I think it also is a, a sense of, of perhaps him showing some mercy to her or at least a little bit of empathy. He has his own love problems. Um, and perhaps the hope is, is that with some time and distance, they can resolve things on their own. If nothing else, it's a politically savvy move because as a ruler, you don't necessarily want to anger your populace. And Theseus is in an impossible situation right now. He's either going to upset Aegeus, the father, or he's going to upset Hermia, the daughter. Perhaps they can work it out on their own. And it turns out by the ending of the play, almost everyone has worked it out. The only one who's unhappy or doesn't get his way is Aegeus. But I suppose that's the best of all worlds. We do know that at the ending of the play, though, that Helena and Demetrius are back together because of the love juice. I, I don't know if that's necessarily a happy ending from at least Demetrius's perspective because he's been controlled and manipulated. But at the time, it might be seen as a kind of reestablishment of order because ultimately he had pledged himself to Helena at least prior to the play itself. So thinking about things like the portrayal of female in this play and how oftentimes we have strong defiant females and sometimes they upset our expectations and sometimes are rewarded for upsetting our expectations the darkness and the comedy that i had just suggested the city versus the forest where athens is again supposed to represent the rule of man and law as opposed to the forest which is nature and that which is uncivilized of course, Act 5, the play within a play, is so important because it's a commentary on the play we've just seen. And Puck, I had asked the question of who is your favorite and least favorite um, actor in terms of the performance that we watched. And in terms of least favorite, many of you had indicated Puck, and I had to agree that I, I think that I agree as well. I've seen Puck played in a lot of different ways. And it's interesting because Puck is usually considered to be the prime role in this drama, that um, if you are an actor who's really aspiring to make your mark, you either want to play bottom or you want to play Puck because Puck is controlling and manipulating all of the action. In fact, Puck is much like a Shakespeare character, controlling and manipulating the action. And I'm not so sure if this actor really got the sense of Puck 
per se, but I, I do have to admit for those of you who talk about the actor paying, playing Bottom as one of your favorites, he definitely is my favorite. He brings an incredible comedic sense to Bottom. And Bottom is supposed to be funny, but I've never seen Bottom done better in all of the performances that I've seen thus far of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Not that I've seen all of the performances. You'll notice that in the notes below, underneath the first section, Considerations, which I've been talking about, I've indicated plot. I had suggested to you that you might want to keep a chart of all of the love relationships so that you don't become confused. But you can see that Theseus and Hippolyta, they're engaged, so that's one status of relationship. And that Hippolyta has been conquered in war. So that's the power struggle. And this is a kind of typical love, again, a political union. We have Hermia and Lysander. They're the dating couple, but her father, Aegeus, does not approve, but she's going basically with her heart rather than her father's dictate. That would be rather atypical at the time for a daughter to defy her father and then at the ending of the play to actually get her way. We have Helena and Demetrius. As I had indicated, they represent a fickle kind of love because Demetrius had pledged himself to Helena prior to the play, but he's changed his mind. We have um, Demetrius and Helena also representing an unrequited love, or, or I'm sorry, Demetrius and Hermia representing an unrequited love, and, and that Hermia does not love Demetrius, though Demetrius says he loves her. And then we have the married couple, Fairy Oberon and Titania, who are arguing over that changeling, another power struggle. Bonham and his cohorts, who are rehearsing a play about, of course, love so we can make a commentary about love shakespeare's also very clever this is a way for him to make a commentary about his competition fellow play fellow actors and playwrights at the time because the play pyramus and thisbe is absolutely ridiculous it reminds me of an elementary school performance and that's deliberate that this is basically Shakespeare saying this is the kind of quality or lack of quality that you will be experiencing if you go to my competition. We had discussed briefly this idea of King Theseus ordering Hermia to follow her father's will or face either a nunnery or death. And what she decides, because she's given some time to contemplate, is to run away to the woods. Perhaps that's the oldest reaction of two lovers is to run away. And then in, in an illustration of just how irrational love can be, in that Hermia decides to tell her best friend Helena that they're going to run away, she and Lysander. And then Helena decides in an irrational moment that she's going to tell Demetrius that Hermia's run away so that hopefully Demetrius will be thankful to her and will want to be with Helena. That doesn't make any kind of sense, but... Again, love is oftentimes quite irrational and interferes with reasoning and thinking. What Demetrius does is quite predictable. He goes into the woods so that he can run after Hermia. And Helena follows. It's a wonderful way to get all of the major characters in the woods, including Bottom and his cohorts, who they say as rehearsing their play, they don't want to rehearse it in the city because they want a certain level of privacy. And then Fairy Oberon in anger over the fact that Queen Titania has defied him and, and even has forsworn their marriage bed, uses Puck as his servant, or seemingly kind of servant, to distract fairy Titania with love juice so that she falls in love with the first thing she sees and then he can take the changeling boy. He decides to intervene in the human world as well, and he wants to help Helena by putting the love juice, or having Puck put the love juice in Demetrius's eyes, Perhaps because he feels a certain level of sympathy for Helena. After all, he too, King uh, Fairy Oberon, has, has his own love troubles. Now, the way that he gives his order can be somewhat misinterpreted because Oberon tells Puck to put the love juice on the man wearing the Athenian garb. There are two men who are wearing Athenian garb. This is where you can have a little bit of fun playing Puck, if you are the actor playing Puck, in that you can make it seem as if this is accidental. I was just following orders, and I chose the wrong man. Instead of putting the love juice on Demetrius's eyes, I put the love juice on Lysander's eyes instead. Or 
you can have Puck acting very deliberately in the sense of that Puck knows he's supposed to put the love juice on Demetrius's eyes, but he puts it on Lysander's eyes because Puck is known for being mischievous. In fact, there is a Puck that exists in fairy folklore, and it's a mischievous fairy. Not an evil fairy, not a fairy that would hurt or, or maim or kill, but a prankster, in effect. So Puck also decides on his own, just for his own amusement, that he's going to turn Bottom into an ass. Why not? Bottom is at the bottom of the social scale. That's why his name is Bottom. He's a laborer. But he acts like a bottom. He acts like an ass. He acts like an idiot, a buffoon. And it just so happens that when Fairy Titania wakes, the first thing she sees is Bottom, the literal and figurative ass. Because love is blind. Another statement that Shakespeare is making about love. And if you want to have some sort of contemporary parallel, a question could be, well, how many of us have fallen in love with an ass? Even though we've been told we're in love with an ass. You don't need to answer that question, by the way. You can just contemplate. But basically, you can see the timeless and universal themes that are embedded within Shakespeare's play. So, Puck says that this was all a mistake, that he put the love juice on Lysander instead of Demetrius, so he will rectify. And the love juice is now on Demetrius, but the love juice is never removed from Lysander. And the result is that now both men are in love with Helena, the tall blonde, rather than Hermia, the short brunette, which is the exact opposite of how we began the play. And this leads to all kinds of conflict between the lovers. If we were watching a tragedy, this would end in death. But we know we're watching a comedy so that it has to be resolved after a good amount of arguing. Notice this happens in Act 3, the pinnacle of the conflict within the drama. And after a good amount of insults. And as things begin to get rectified, the love juice will remain on Demetrius so that he can be in love with Helena. And Helena loves Demetrius. Again, modern day audiences are a bit confused and saying, how could she still care about him after all of the insults and the way that he treated her? Again, this would be considered a kind of happy ending. And although Helena might seem rather passive and weak, um, she does make an interesting statement at the beginning of the play that women were not made to woo. In other words, she takes the role of pursuer, which would be very unusual for the time period. And actually, she's successful in taking the role of pursuer. Though, from a modern day standpoint, it's difficult to read some of her lines when she says to the effect, treat me like your dog, your cur. Again, it's she almost um, could be the equivalent of the modern day stalker who is going after Demetrius when he clearly has no interest in her. But nevertheless, she does get her way at the ending of the play. So the love juice remains on Demetrius, but it needs to be removed from Lysander so that he can love Hermia again and Hermia loves him. And again, all is forgiven so that we can have this happy ending despite all of the insults and the conflict that I'll talk about in greater depth next class. The love juice is removed from Titania now that uh, Fairy King Oberon has a changeling and she has to come to the realization that she was in love with an ass. Though one might say that Oberon's kind of an ass too. He acts pretty mean-spirited. But nevertheless, she comes to her, quote, senses and realizes that as someone of her stature could never fall in love with or could never truly have an equal relationship with a Bonham, a laborer, especially someone as idiotic as Bonham in this play. The donkey spell, so Bonham is no longer an ass. Um, he returns to human form, though he continues to act like an ass. And King Theseus, who has to make a decision about how to rectify all of this, decides that since the couples themselves are happy, basically to leave the status quo, the only one who's unhappy, who didn't get his way, was Aegeus. But it seems that everybody else has gotten their way. And then we see in Act 5, which seems like it's tacked on, but trust me, it's not. Um, the performance of Pyramus and Thisbe, which happens to be about love gone bad. Um, Pyramus and Thisbe, if it reminds you of another very famous Shakespearean play, Romeo and Juliet, it should. And we think that Romeo and Juliet was written around the same time as A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, 
Though, generally, we think the comedies were written towards the earlier part of Shakespeare's career and the tragedies more towards the latter part of Shakespeare's career. But again, as you know, with Shakespeare, there's a great amount under dispute, including time periods. And what we see in Pyramus and Thisbe, which I'll talk about in greater depth next class, poor writing, poor acting, poor directing, poor everything. Uh, again, a commentary on Shakespeare's competition. We'll also see a lot of humor and bawdiness in Pyramus and Thisbe that I wanted to draw your attention to, as well as the fact that all of the characters who are watching Pyramus and Thisbe are taking great delight in mocking this absurd performance, but they never once stopped to consider that they themselves had been equally absurd when they were in the forest with their own love tribulations. So they don't have insight. But the big insight is supposed to be for us as audience that if we watched all of Midsummer Night's Dream and we mocked and laughed at these lovers and we never once stopped to consider that we ourselves have been equally absurd when it's come to love or if we haven't. So understand that we will be. It's just a matter of time. That's part of the human's condition. Then we've learned nothing. It's no surprise that Puck gives a final speech to try to give an apology, though in typical Puck fashion, it's a backhanded apology. Because by this point, Shakespeare has probably offended everybody in the audience of the Globe Theater. The rich and the poor, the young and the old, the educated and the non-educated, all different status of relationships that basically we're all idiots when it comes to love. But at least Shakespeare is equal opportunity so that he doesn't necessarily um, he doesn't necessarily um, 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 section himself off from this that he himself also is um, subject to the follies of love. So what I wanted to do next class was to talk about in the notes below starting with the third section about the different acts and some of the messages within the different acts. So that'll be Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, Act 4, Act 5. And then talk a little bit about some of the quotation and themes in the play. Though I've alluded to some of them already. But hopefully this gives you a little bit of an overview of A Midsummer Night's Dream. And I'm hopeful that you would have finished reading the play at this point, as well as seen the performance in its entirety, and that you are beginning with Much Ado About Nothing. But before we get to Much Ado, we still have to put some closure onto Midsummer. As I said, we will not be having a meeting on Friday um, because it, it seems like we're doing okay with our calendar. So we can just keep to our normal meeting schedule Monday and Wednesday. So on Monday, I will put some closure onto Midsummer Night's Dream. And as I had indicated, you've got a little bit of time in terms of submitting in your journal for Midsummer. I gave you a, a brief extension in the event that you wanted to um, have some closure to Midsummer with Monday's class and some time to think about uh, Midsummer before you hand it in your journal. So the only thing that's left is the attendance question, which would be due on Friday, and that's the 17th at 8 a.m. And the attendance question is, what did you find to be the most surprising thing about the play in Midsummer Night's Dream? And why? What did you find to be the most surprising thing about the play now that you've read it, I hope, and watched the performance, I hope? What was the most surprising thing and why was it surprising? I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. And we will continue on next class. Take care. Bye.